Welcome everyone. If, uh, if you could please take a seat, we're going to go ahead and get started. Try to stay on time if we can. We've got the, uh, <clears throat> uh, just a note about the schedule. There was a, a bit of a misprint. So the, <clears throat> for the next half hour, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the Northwest Coast Textiles exhibit that the museum is going to host here next summer. And then following that about uh, 2.15, we'll shift over to the Canoe Colloquium Part 1. And then there'll, there'll be a break and then the uh, Canoe Colloquium Part 2 will start after the break and in, in the same space. So I'd like to welcome you to our presentation and I'd like to thank the Aquan for hosting us on their territory. I'm Steve Henriksen, Curator of Collections at the Alaska State Museum, and my co-presenter today is Lonnie Hotch, who is with the Jilkat Kwan Heritage Center in Kluckwan, and she's also serving as one of the co-curators for the upcoming exhibit. And what I'd like to do is give you a bit of a preview today of <clears throat> what the exhibit's going to be about and show you some slides of some of the robes that'll be in the show some of the concepts that we'll try to share uh, based on our work with the co-curators team of weavers who uh, is working with us. And uh, to start out, um, Lonnie will talk about some of the themes that we've developed for the show. And then we have some, after that, we have some slides to show of some of the um, objects that will support that theme. So, Lonnie? So, <clears throat> We're, we've been working together, having meetings, and uh, talking about the weaving tradition uh, amongst our different people groups. And um, we have several uh, different threads that we want to follow in the exhibit. And um, one of them is how the Chilcat, the Raven's Tail weaving relate uh, originated maybe through uh, the basketry tradition and so there's going to be some examples of that in the exhibit and I think Steve's going to be sharing some slides on it. Um, I myself one of the weavings that I did was uh, the basket mother robe and it's based on the baskets in my family collection uh, baskets that my great grandmother had woven, my grandmother had woven. So um, there's also the uh, subsistence ensemble in Cluck One at the Heritage Center, and then in uh, the Time Warp exhibit, there was a uh, piece by Victoria Moody that was a uh, cedar bark robe. So there's ex good examples in, I think. Steve will share some film, um, some photos of those. Um, the origins of weaving. Uh, we want to compare the different tribal traditions between the Flinget, Haida, and Simpsian people. Um, how the uh, tribes use them, who made them, where they're found. And then we're going to be... Um, investigating and um, displaying the raven's tail or the uh, northern geometric style of weavings and um, different examples of those. I think there's a lot of contemporary weavings uh, as well of the, uh, the raven's tail style. And then uh, transition robes that show both the the raven's tail or the geometric tradition and the 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 chilcat style and uh one example of that is the the cluck one healing robe and uh, that's the piece that i learned on and there are some other examples and i think we're trying to get some loans from some prominent museums around the world so we're working on getting funds for that if any of you are so inclined to want to help us get some of those bigger pieces. Um, we're going to uh, 
be focusing on the Chilkat weaving as well. The Nachin is the Slingat word for them, and I think in Haida they call it Nachin. Nachin. And um, I'm not sure what the Simshian word is. Something like Halate. Oh, Halate. Spirit wraps around. Okay. And then uh, another focus will be on the, the context, the cultural context of the weavings. And um, I know the spiritual context within the Thlingit culture. And then um, also how the <coughs> robes would relate to certain geographical places or um, show like a deed of ownership. And some examples of that would be the Sakai robe um, owned by the Fluka Hari clan in Haines, and uh, the Herring Rock robe owned by the Kiksedi. Yeah. And then um, a, a recent, well, that's not real recent, but fairly recent in 2016, I did the Burners Bay weaving, which represents the Chilkat Southern Boundary. So those are some of the threads that we're talking about. And then there's a whole wide range of contemporary weaving. And I remember having a big discussion about this in one of our meetings is, what do you call it? Raven's Tail, Chilkat? And I just call them contemporary weavings because I, I know in my own experience, it may not look like a raven seal, may not look like a chilkat, but I'm using those techniques to create it. So um, I think that's a good blanket term myself, a contemporary weaving. So I'll turn it back to Steve. I like that blanket term. That's a good one. <clears throat> so, Lonnie, maybe you could uh, <clears throat> take this microphone so you can comment as we go through. Okay. Yeah, so um, we were uh, really excited to get the opportunity to tell this, uh, this amazing story of <clears throat> northern northwest coast textiles, starting with the geometric tradition and how it um, uh, evolved into the what we now call Chilkat weaving or Nahain. <clears throat> and there's there's so many the part of the exhibit for us that's most difficult is knowing what to leave out. There's so many awesome robes out there choices <clears throat> that we'd love to have a hundred robes in the show but we only have room for about 24. So we're trying to um, tell this whole story using uh, 24 objects, some of which are owned by clans, and they've uh, uh, granted us uh, a loan of the robes to be able to to have uh, robes that are <clears throat> not museum pieces, but they're actually a living objects. And we're going to use the actual objects and historical photos and illustrations to tell tell the stories of how they were created and their their history among the people that um, made and used them, the Klingit, Haida, and Simshian primarily. And, See, before, yeah. you, before you go on that, that slide, the herring rock robe is the one on the right, and that uh, shows the Kiksadi ownership of that rock. Right. <clears throat> and Lonnie, do you want to talk about this grouping? Okay, this is uh, my, gr my great-grandmother, Mary Willard, on the left with the um, two robes there, uh, the little baby eagle robe and the beaver robe. And then on the top is my great, great grandmother, San Tots, who I'm named after, on the left, and then her daughter, Mary Willard, on the right. And that's me below there, in front of the Circu River robe. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, one of the <clears throat> one of the features of the exhibit. We'll be talking about some of the the lineages of weavers, and uh, in Lonnie Lonnie's family has five generations uh, of weavers, and that's a, an important uh, way this tradition was uh, was transferred from one generation to another. Was in 
within the, the family. So we want to talk about that somewhat. <clears throat> and also, when, whenever possible, we'd like to <clears throat> bring out some of the history of the individual weavers. This is a, that herring rock robe that uh, Lonnie mentioned by Annie Claney was the weaver of this one. And also talk about new ways of, of transmitting the tradition. Uh, on the right is uh, Dolores Churchill's family, uh, who, who do both uh, the geometric raven's tail tradition as well as the, the Nahain tradition. And also through, uh, a lot of people nowadays learn through the university, and we have the picture of Dolores Churchill and Cheryl Samuel. Uh, Cheryl uh, being a, a researcher and weaver who, who helped to um, reintroduce or, or revitalize raven's tail weaving in, in uh, the 20th century. So we'll be talking about that revival. But also, like Lonnie said, cultural context, talk about how, <clears throat> how these robes are, are uh, you know, sacred objects given in that they, they are, are full of spirits and are used for healing purposes and other types of things that, um, that involve uh, the spirit world. But also as uh, uh, the evolution from sacred object to um, ob art object. And on the right is some Chilkat robes made for the market uh, in a turn of the century uh, curio shop in Sitka. And nowadays, many of the robes that are made today are made for collectors or museums. So uh, I know that I'm sure that many of you are familiar with the with the geometric style of robe, these were the ones that the earliest Europeans who visited the Northwest Coast described, uh, not the Chilkat style robe, but one with geometric patterns. This is the a uh, Haida leader meeting the Vancouver expedition in, uh, off of Prince of Wales Island in 1799. Art, that's an artist's depiction of it. So some of the earliest uh, robes from the coast collected by Captain Cook and others are these uh, sh b robes made uh, out of shredded cedar bark, some of which have a border that uses uh, what we would now refer to as a raven's tail motif. This one's got the, um, it's primarily shredded yellow bark twined, but then along the bottom edge, there's a strip of a sea otter um, wool, or sea otter, um, mountain goat wool uh, that's using the, that lightning pattern that you see on raven's tail robes. So there's uh, some ancient connection between basketry, these cedar bark robes, and then the geometric style robes. And in some of the basketry we'll have in the show, there's some of the same motifs are used in both the basketry and the raven's tail weaving like this uh, is a uh, rectangles within rectangles, and that's something that uh, shows up as well as a, in plating. It's not really skip stitch uh, like it in twining, but this one has raised stitches on the diagonal, and that's something that is used in raven's tail weaving as well. So we'll look at the the connections between basketry and and textile weaving. Unfortunately, we won't be getting this robe for the exhibit. The uh, there's only uh, about a dozen uh, raven's tail robes in existence, and we're hoping to get one of them. Uh, this one is in St. Petersburg. The Russians have four, the largest group of original raven's tail robes in existence, and this is one of them. Uh, this is the one that we hope to get on loan from the British Museum. It's um, collected by Captain Cook, 1776 uh, circa. And it's, it's in somewhat good condition. There's, there's some losses there, but given how old it is, uh, that doesn't matter to us too much. Just to be able to see something like this would be a, a really great thing to be able to bring this back to Alaska and show a lot of the contemporary weavers what the, one of the originals looks like. Look like. And um, I, I think that even today, the, the vast majority of, of contemporary weavers who do raven's tail weaving have never seen an original robe. So we're hoping to be able to do that. It's just for us a monumental challenge because the price tag 
to bring this from London to Alaska and back is about uh, $35,000. And uh, so it's a tall order for us these days. We do have a fragment of an original that's in the museum here. It's actually on exhibit in the clan house just across the hall. And it's a fragment of a robe that came from Castle Hill over in Sitka. There was an archaeological project there that uh, uncovered uh, some fragments of an original. And we'll definitely have those in the show, but we'd sure like to have a much more intact robe to show, um, to show that geometric tradition. Now, we, we're, we're um, also hoping to borrow this, this robe. It's the earliest um, known Chilkat robe that has a well-established date of collection of 1832. And that's important because we know that by 1832, the Chilkat tradition has, was fully developed and uh, they had shifted over from the geometric pattern a geometric style to the cur more curvilineal style, style of, of form line design in the robes. And that is a monumental uh, uh, advancement in the, t the technology to be able to produce curved designs in, in uh, uh, twining. So we'd like to talk about that. Lonnie? I just wanted to mention that uh, we're, we also, if we can get this robe, then I will bring the pattern board from my family's collection down because we have this, um, I have this pattern board. This one by chance? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is that a picture I sent you? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so that, and that's, uh, that, that's what we're hoping that this exhibit will, when you're doing an, an exhibit and you have so many people concentrating on this subject, that discoveries like these are inevitably part of the process. So many exhibits have involved uh, finding out new information about things. And, and the museum, the Peabody Putty Museum at Salem, Massachusetts, they didn't have any documentation of where this was collected. But I think the fact that the pattern board has been in Cluck Juan for hundreds of years strongly suggests that it came from there. And this is one, there's only two robes that have these tana patterns, the patterns of coppers woven into them, and both of them are from Klukwan. The other one is for sure. Uh, we're also looking at the depictions of robes in early illustrations as well as uh, historical photos. So these are uh, s strong evidence of the early tradition, the uh, 1793 drawing by Backstrom of a Hide a leader wearing a geometric slash Chilkat style robe and the Tikhanov of Catlian wearing a raven's tail robe are really critical information. And then, like Lonnie was mentioning, the, the transitional robes, the robes that have elements of both geom geometric tradition and the um, Chilkat tradition, we, we have hopes if we have enough funding to borrow this from, one from the National Museum of Canada or no, the uh, Royal Ontario Museum. Uh, this is a, a Simshian robe, and there's, this is the only raven's tail transitional robe that there's an actual historical photo of someone wearing it from the Nishka. And then as far as the, uh, the diffusion of this tradition, th this is a Tikhanov watercolor from the early 1800s of a, a chief of the Alaska Peninsula, and a uh, um, Alutic chief or Sugpiak chief wearing a uh, transi transitional Ravenstail robe. And there's lots of trade relations and uh, other contacts that came about between the Klingit and the Alutic. And that this may be the result of trade, but it's possible that they were making uh, robes such as that as well. So f fast forward 150 years to Cheryl Samuel's work and she was able in the 1970s and 80s to go around and visit all the existing uh, raven's tail robes and fragments thereof and, and reverse engineer the process and wrote a, a book and developed a lot of educational resources to train weavers how to do this. This is a, a robe that's out at the university here that Cheryl wove uh, as part of her uh, 
uh, study of the technique to real, make sure she had it down good. And this is the the first robe in this new period where she's trying out new colors and and uh, of of the warp and weft. And that's since been something that's happened. A number of weavers, including Lonnie, have have tried out new color combinations. But the the patterns here are uh, are very similar to the ones on the old robes. When Cheryl came to Alaska to start teaching people that she went through a process of consulting with elders and trying to determine if this really was the right thing to do. Uh, for some reason, we don't know why, but there was a shift that came about in the early 1800s where they changed over, um, as far as we know, pretty, pretty dramatically over a short period of time from the geometric tradition to Chilcat weaving. And, you know, as she wanted to be sure that this was really the right thing to do. I mean, who, who gave her permission to bring back this tradition? Well, Esther Littlefield <laughs> was one of the elders that uh, Cheryl consulted, and Esther is, is the only living person at that time to, known to be connected to one of the traditional owners of a raven's tail robe, and that's her... Uh, one of her ancestors, Catlian, in that Tikhanov watercolor. So she was uh, instrumental in helping Cheryl get started up here, and also Vesta Johnson, a, a Haida elder, too. And both of them were instrumental in getting this off and running again. Uh, some of the first robes were recreations of robes that were in really horrible condition or existed only in historical Lani. Oh, uh, so uh, then uh, in this one was done in Sitka of a uh, a very poor uh, robe in very poor condition. In Juneau, this uh, the weavers here took on a project to <clears throat> do a version of a robe based on this swift robe that has a different design on both sides. <clears throat> and this is the hands across time robe that's on display in the museum, and that'll be in the show. That's when it was danced at uh, Celebration 92, Ethan Pettigrew. Here's uh, uh, several of Lonnie's uh, contemporary robes with uh, where she's using different uh, colors and also uh, coming up with a wide variety of new designs too that are meaningful to her family and her uh, people living in Klukwan. And uh, on, the, on the left is a a, a double rainbow robe by Cheryl Samuel. That was one of her more recent robes. And uh, Kay Parker and Vicki Sobolev worked on this um, raven's tail robe with a chill cap border there. So uh, Kay is also, uh, there are no um, historic raven's tail uh, tunics in existence, but uh, Kay Parker studied chill cap tunics and uh, and designed this raven's tail slash chill cat tunic that's in our collection now. And since uh, Cheryl reintroduced the, the, these ideas to Alaska, Alaska Native weavers have really taken this to, um, to orbit as far as the number of robes woven in the wide variety of designs. This is uh, uh, my wedding with Janice. Uh, and we, we borrowed a bunch of robes for that. And there's even now there's a lot more than when that was taken. For our show, we want to have both old and new traditions. So we have permission from the Kick Study to exhibit their frog coming out uh, robe by Jenny Clonat along with their frog hat. And uh, what I'd like to do now is turn, turn things over to Jackie Manning. She's our curator of exhibits, and she wanted to give you some idea of our our design work to date. Steve, to move forward, am I just pressing the arrows? Yeah. All right. Hi, thanks for having me. So um, everything that uh, Steve and Lonnie were talking about, my, my job is to try to make all these wonderful ideas and all these incredible robes and um, uh, fit in the gallery. So here's an example of, uh, or here's a, a drawing of our temporary galleries where this show is going to go into the two temporary galleries across the way. And the first thing we needed to know is how many ropes would fit. So quick sketch, we, uh, we did, um, 
try to get an estimate. And this is an ever moving target. So uh, this is the next iteration of how many ropes could fit at uh, if we had different mount styles. And I'm gonna just point out a couple things on here that you can look out for in the exhibit. Um, if some of you are here yesterday, the, the weaving group that's doing the dye project, Part of that project is going to be on exhibit as well so we've got that in one of the um, the first rooms as you walk into the temporary gallery we also have represented there's going to be a stage with full-size mannequins um, that are fully clothed and then you're seeing some this also shows some robes that get mounted on the wall as well as some robes that are mounted uh, on sort of a figure style mount right there so we've been working with with Steve and the curators for this exhibit to look at different ways to mount robes that kind of give a sense of it being on a person and not just flat on a wall. And we will have both of those. You can see a, a lot of notes on this. Every time there's a meeting with the curators, we go back, we, we take more notes, we move things and add, mostly adding. Uh, every sto new stories that need to, to be added in. The first, uh, meeting we had with the, with the curators are, are uh, the other exhibits person Aaron Elmore who could not be here uh, he did some sketches so we could start to look at the gallery and different ways to present uh, present these this exhibit and we've been talking about you know of course there's still a working title but one of the goals is to have a um, silhouette of a dancer dancing a robe and so that's what's being represented right there this is an early sketch um, so, and this is a sketch here by Steve Henriksen with uh, the addition of the the uh, basketry pattern and getting that added to the exhibit. So a way of communicating is we get a sketch from Steve, additions that need to be made to the exhibit. We're hopeful there's going to be um, artists working in the gallery, representation of that and this is uh, early design of um, the different ways the robes will be mounted we have to of course always be concerned about security so we have to do staging and and um, some stanchions and and different things but looking again at those spaces so these we presented to the um, to the cure the curatorial team to look at and uh, and start getting ideas flowing and then at this point we're just gathering notes from from the weavers and how to best uh, adjust this exhibit. This is an early mount style that Aaron made. Uh, he calls it a barrel mount. It was first rounded, and uh, after after Steve looked at it and we've and we had different people look at it, we thought, oh, it really needs more of a shoulder feel. So, uh, so he adjusted. Here's a picture of the jig. Lots of steaming. Lots of. Uh, cutting wood down to multiple pieces. If you look up on the left, you can see it's lots of pieces that are glued together to be able to bend and do uh, this style mount here that, that he's been working on. And of course, every robe is different. So every single one of these mounts is um, custom fit to the robe. And uh, here he is sewing organs on the bottom. So we did, we're trying our best to have the fringe have the feel of the the fringe not having something opaque behind it but that you get the sense that it could move and so uh but we do need to be able to support it so or that silk organza he's working with there here's the uh next step one of our um trying the robe on again multiple times every time it's different slats get moved and adjusted to make sure it fits and i will uh in just a minute here, turn that robe around so you guys can see the back. And one of the things that did come up was uh, weavers are also very excited to see the back of a robe. So if we're able to put these at an angle in the exhibit where people can see the back, uh, the colors aren't as faded. Lonnie, when she just looked at the back of this robe, was able to identify different weaving techniques and, and how different parts were attached. So that, of course, would be of interest to the weaver. So this mount style allows, um, it's designed to support, but also give a little bit of, uh, an, you can see a little bit of what's going on on the back of those. Here's just an image of that. And here's uh, in one of the fittings for Raven's Tail Robe. 
slats all got cut down and the organza gets trimmed. Here's a, a recent adjustment to, to the design for the entrance into the exhibit. So again, looking at that, uh, a video of a dancer, multiple, uh, a couple of mannequins we've we've added there's going to be a, a child maybe maybe two ch child mannequins added uh so again constantly resketching and looking and then i added this one this is a picture steve sent and of course uh part of the challenge is always making uh every all of uh the ideas come to life and so the new challenge and it cropped unfortunately the top of the image got cropped but uh the eagle down from the shuck yet having that be floating in the air how do we do that we don't know yet so um thought i would end on that one there but if uh if actually uh, adriana would you mind helping me i'm just going to turn this robe around and you guys can see the back so the uh it Every time we've uh, exhibited a uh, a robe in the, in our museum and many others as well, the the robe has been either flat on the wall or on a mannequin, and this is sort of a halfway in between those approaches. We wanted to be able to show the robe in its sculptural position, which is more of a three dimensional object, and so it's uh, it's been a real treat to to see Aaron and Jackie working out. I mean, they, they've already made a bunch of these mounts and each one is a little bit different and a little bit better. So it really does have the, the look of something kind of frozen in place, floating on its own. I, I asked Aaron to try to, uh, try to produce a mount that had no visible means of support. <laughs> so somehow he has to make that, uh, that one stick go away somehow, maybe by using drones to hold it, I'm not sure, but. <laughs> <laughs> but that that and that that and the eagle down. I'm really interested to see what he comes up with to to have like a cloud of eagle down floating over the over the robes. But it's it's really uh, I think it really brings in uh, uh, that sculptural quality because this is the way the robes were were meant to be seen. And uh, given that they're frozen in space, it allows you to c get a close up view of the the. Uh, incredible artistry that goes into them so we're we want to show these uh, the robes as both art objects as well as uh, objects with uh, the most sacred uh, cultural meaning that you can imagine so it's it's a challenge to fit everything in into a limited space but we're well on our way to doing that thanks to our our uh, weaver advisors Lonnie uh, we uh, Evelyn Vanderhoop is the Haida uh, co-curator and Marie Oldfield is the Simshan co-curator. We also have uh, a team of local weavers helping us, Kay Parker, Lily Hudson, Janice Criswell, and we've talked to many, many others about various aspects of this, so I think it's really going to be uh, exciting and new and a whole lot of fun, so I encourage you to uh, come back um, in the first Friday in May is the scheduled opening of the show, and we'll have, we're hoping to have a tie-in to, to celebration next year as well, and it'll be up all summer. So with that, I just wanted to find out if you have any questions or comments, and um, yes? Well, I think uh, I'm thinking that's uh, something that is uh, tradition for for their family to do that. And I've, have you heard that? Have you heard other weavers talk about that, Lonnie? I've heard, I've heard of other um, instances okay. like that where, um, you, like for the eyes too, you have to finish the eyes as well yeah. if you start it or if you're, if you're um, weaving a box, you need to, to close up that box and not just leave it hanging open. Yeah. All right. Are there any? It seems to be a mighty symbolic thing. So in general and in life. Yes. Yes, so many, so many. 
<laughs> yeah, don't leave things hanging open. <laughs> yeah, there's, a, yeah um, there's life lessons certainly in these robes and in the process of making them, and it, it parallels the lives of the weavers. And every robe that they make is kind of a snapshot in time for them, and they remember what was happening at the time, the trials, the tribulations, the joys, so it's all kind of embedded in that, and, and we definitely want to bring out some of those uh, personal and uh, technical aspects of the weaving in this show. Lucy. Yeah, well, it, we, we certainly would like to do that, and uh, it's all dependent on, on funding at this point, but we're, we're very hopeful that at least a smaller version of the show can, can go to Kluckwan and have it on exhibit in the Heritage Center there. And beyond that, it's a question mark yet. We're still developing our, our resources. And by the way, you can make your checks payable to the Friends, <laughs> Friends of the State Library Archives and Museums in case anybody wants to. It, it, Permanent fund dividends are coming up, so you know, feel free to contribute. Are there any other questions? Yes. Very beautiful exhibit uh, information about uh, Chilkat blankets, and um, <clears throat> just want to add on to this that uh, when I was uh, writing against uh, the clear cutting of Haynes. Klukwan area, some trees. I ran across an interview done with Dr. Uh, Austin Hammond about Chilkat blankets, and he was talking about how uh, the government was uh, asking the Thlinkit Indians, well, where's your title to your land? And they were re referring to paper titles, a colonial European uh, frame of reference and that uh, Dr. Austin Hammond said, here's referring to his Chilkat, one of his Chilkat blankets, here's our title right here. And it wasn't accepted or understood by the European uh, courts and uh, legal people from uh, <clears throat> Europe. And that Chilkat blankets, some of them depict land ownership, clan designs owned by the clan, and the people know that the clans and uh, names, names for men and women come from these designs. And I just want to add that on about the different uh, lens about what a title can mean. Yeah, thank you very much. You got another question over here. We are gonna, that'll have to be the last one since we have another uh, presentation coming. Did you say who the who made this one? In this, in this, uh, in this illustration, uh, this is a, a, a diving whale pattern robe that is in a private collection that the artist just did a painting of. So it's not, a, I don't know that we know the provenance of it. Okay. I was wondering if those were buttons right in a corner. Looks like two buttons. Just um, up on top, well, up right on in a corner. Yeah, yeah, right at the top of the fringe. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's the that's the tie off uh, of the side braid. It's just more of the same wall, but just wrapped a little bit differently. And there's some uh, difference in each robe might have a little bit different of uh, pattern. There are sometimes the same, but it's just the tie off for the side braids coming down. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming. We're going to shift gears here in the next uh, presentation in this same space. We'll just start in a few minutes. It's the Canoe Colloquial. Colloquial. Thank you.